my friends, we are back for Elvis week and uh, today this should be a fun one. We're going to something called Elvis in Conversations where they get people that either worked with Elvis or knew Elvis to come and tell stories. So let's go on in and see what's going on today. Days with Jordan the Lion begins now. Let's go check this out. All right. Same stained glass in my house. Coming out today, we have Charlie McCoy and David Briggs to tell us a little bit more about their experience Woo! working on right. after last night. And also, we have Larry Strickland, gospel singer, and uh, always fun to talk to him, and one of my favorite people, Cynthia Pepper, to talk about Hollywood, the movies, and Elvis. It's going to be amazing, not just for what we're going to do for Elvis Week, which is going to be the best Elvis Week we've ever had next year, um, but we've got a movie, uh, we've got a television show, we've got all this new great stuff coming out. Uh, and it's really, you know, it, it's amazing that, you know, it will be 45 years later, uh, Elvis is going to be front and center in so many ways. Elvis wanted to be in movies so bad, uh, and unfortunately a lot of the movies that Elvis were in were so bad. Uh, and they were just, they said, we've got the biggest star in the world, ne no, never mind a script, never mind a story, never yeah. mind a set, you put them up there, people, you know, fill the seats. You know, I think that, you know, he will be, and I think everyone in this audience and everyone everywhere is going to be, we're going to be proud because uh, Elvis was the greatest performer of the 20th century. I don't think there's, you know, you want to talk about the Eagles, you want to talk about the Eagles. And, you know, just having to interact, you know, when we, when, when we did the gospel record, just listening to his raw takes and listening to outtakes, it, it was, he was otherworldly. I've had the pleasure in my life of, talking to and dealing with people who are just revolutionary. And there are paintings that I've looked at when I look at them and say, this can't come from this world. And it, and it makes me believe in something more. And when you hear Elvis's voice, it, you feel the same way. And when you hear it just raw, it just, you know, there's a feeling to it. Uh, and Baz Luhrmann, who is just an artist, you know, this is a $150 million movie that is coming out in theaters June of next year. Uh, that such time and, 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 and caring was taken into the make, make, making of this movie, uh, that Tom Hanks is absolutely just transformationally unbelievable in. Uh, the casting of this movie, uh, the story in this movie, uh, you know, Elvis, you know, it, it is, it's very easy to empathize with Elvis and this movie makes it, easy, it easier. And, and as Tom said, you know, this is what's going to pass down to the next generation and the next generation. This is going to get a whole new generation of fans. Uh, knowing what we already know is there's only one Elvis. And this is definitely a movie that you want to see in the theaters. Uh, Warner Brothers is saying that it will be just a theatrical release, so it's not going to be a day and date like they're doing with HBO Max with a bunch of things. Oh, yeah. Obviously, the world changes, so we'll, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, but it's a movie that's so lush and so big and so speaks to, you know, a lot of this movie, you're actually able to look at Memphis, look at Tupelo through Elvis's eyes, which I think is really brilliant and wonderful. Not in a documentary way, but just, you know, if you think about how big Elvis's eyes, eyes were the first time he went into a church and saw a gospel and heard gospel, how, how important that was. You actually get that feeling. This movie really just takes you to a place in time. Uh, it's almost like a time machine. Yeah. Uh, and you're able to be with Elvis looking from Elvis's point of view, which I think is really rare, beautiful, and unique. The word came out, Baz came to Tupelo to walk around the birthplace with Austin, who was Boston Butler, who was playing Elvis, to walk around Tupelo Hardware, to walk around that, that town, that city, to just try to understand where he came from. So that's, that's the care. You were talking about the, the artistry of the care. One of the coolest <laughs> nights that I've ever spent at Graceland uh, was behind the mansion from, I want to say, about 1 o'clock to 5 o'clock in the morning with Baz, just talking about who Elvis was. Because, you know, the story, everyone, you know, it, it's been chronicled. Everyone has their side of the story. Everyone has their angle. But why Elvis did things? I mean, Baz really wanted to know what was in his mind and why he wanted, you know, what the reasons were for his actions, what he needed, what he was, what was he trying to achieve? Yeah. That he was trying to achieve for the last day of his life? You know, what was he trying to, you know, what was his interest, what was he really trying to do? Uh, and it was really amazing to see Austin over a period of time, you know, transforming in, in, into Elvis. It was, it was a phenomenal choice. Uh, if you're not familiar with his work, 
Uh, I think, you know, he, uh, once upon a time in Hollywood, Quentin Tarantino's movie, uh, he was, he played uh, Tex, I believe. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, and he was just phenomenal in it. And he really, he wasn't the obvious choice. Uh, and I could probably get in real trouble to tell you who the obvious choices <laughs> were, who, uh, who didn't really make who didn't make the cut. Yeah. Um, but there was someone from One Direction who really wanted the part. Uh, if anybody knows your kids, uh, that there was a you know a, a gentleman who's actually dating a much older woman. Uh, but I won't give any more clues than that. Right we will not do anything that we don't believe Elvis would want, uh, and that includes something like a hologram. Because I can tell you, I, you know, I can't I chase, chase people off with a stick who want to make a hologram of Elvis. Uh, and besides the fact that I don't think they're good, the reason we won't do a hologram is because Elvis had a conversation with three or four people, and I've spoken with every single person in the room. And it was, it's obvious that he didn't, he, he didn't like them, never wanted to be one, thought it was kitschy, didn't think it was real. And what he realized is there was no soul in it. You know, at the, at the end of the day, there's no soul in a hologram. It's soulless, it, by definition it is. So, you know, for me, when I can watch Elvis, when I can hear Elvis, that's Elvis. Everything else is a pale imitation. I wash uh, my hands in muddy water to hear that opening harmonica lick. That I heard a thousand times. To hear it live. How cool is that? This, uh, this gentleman is a member of the Country Music Hall of Fame, the Mus uh, Musicians Hall of Fame there in Nashville, Grammy winner, plays basically any instrument that sits in front of him longer than about 30 seconds. Uh, he's got some great stories about not only Elvis, but some other artists that he's worked with. He's also done uh, solo albums, of which I also have an intro. <laughs> I don't think he, I, I, I told him about this yesterday afternoon, he said, you bought it. <laughs> The mid-50s was the first time that radio catered to young people, you know. My dad grew up in the big band era, yeah. you know, and, and I love big band, Tommy Dorsey, Glenn Miller, you know. But in the 50s, they started catering to young people. Yeah. And uh, then, you know, all of a sudden, we had television, oh my gosh, and then American Bandstand, and. It was a, it was a great time for rock and roll and pop music then. She, she was definitely twenty years old. <laughs> in in, in Smoot Kvena. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful girl. And it was not only I was distracted. Everybody in the room was distracted. Yeah. His first I, gig was playing for a twenty-year-old Anne Margaret. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. <laughs> There was God, Chet Atkins. There was his disciples, the Nashville 18 musicians. There was his heavenly choir, the Anita Kerr singers, and there was an angel. And uh, so I had played on the demo of the song, so I already knew what to play. And when Chet called, he said, whoever played that, I want them to play exactly what they played on the demo. So I already knew what to play. And uh, it was a thrill, believe me. And at the end of the session, Bob Moore walks over to me. You free Friday? I was free the rest of my life. My book looked like a white horse in a snowstorm. <laughs> Nothing in the planner, right? Right. Uh, and I said, yeah. And he said, come back to this studio. I'm recording Roy Orbison. I was a fan already. I heard, you know, Only the Lonely and Blue Angel and those amazing records that were recorded right in that same room, RCAB. And I went back and we did a, I, we did two songs. We did Candyman and Blue Bite. And uh, Candyman hit the radio. You know, it was it was the back of crying. It was a double sided hit. And. When they started playing Candyman on the radio, my phone started ringing. Sixty years later, I'm still for sale, y'all. <laughs> Can we play on your record? I'll do it. I played. Well, here's some odd instruments I've done on records you may have heard. Trumpet on Everybody Must Get Stoned by Bob Dylan. Oh. It sounded a little uh, like the name of the song because it was kind of that bluesy kind well, of. Well, Salvation Army yeah, style. Yeah, yeah. Uh, That's right. So. Baritone sax on Pretty Woman. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah, I played vibes and uh, orchestra bells on Blue Velvet, Bobby Vinton. Uh, 
Did the tuning guitar on Detroit City by Bobby Bear. Oh, yeah. Jerry Reed picked it and I tuned it. <laughs> yeah. It took both of you. To make well, it did because he had to have a left hand yeah. on, the, on the string, too. Yeah. And, uh, so, yeah. Um, and I played, uh, I played solo, like, lead acoustic guitar on a Bob Dylan song called uh, How, uh, Desolation Road, mm -hmm. Highway yeah. 61 album. Yeah. But mainly, without the harmonica, I wouldn't have gotten a door. I can tell you this for sure. And, and I love the story, though, about that you told me back there about the vibes and how that, because you play keyboards, you were challenged by somebody. Chet Atkins. <laughs> we're on a session, and he comes up to me and says, hey, I don't hear any harmonica on this next song. Go out there and play a couple of notes on the vibes. And I said, Chet, I don't play vibes. He said, oh, go on out there. You can do it. <laughs> So I went out there and I got two mallets and I figured out where the pedal was and I said, I said this is fun. <laughs> there will never be an artist with the stature of Elvis ever again. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, uh, the younger generation now, they don't have an attention span anymore. You know, it's, uh, oh, I'll Google it. You know, and, and, and but, uh, what they did, you know, over his whole career was incredible. Yeah. It was absolutely incredible. And, uh, you know, the movies and, but uh, he was bigger than life. And when I, when I got the call to record with him, I, I was thrilled. And it's about, it's about being in that room, making music together, all, all the musicians together. And that was Elvis. We, we've only in the last 10, 15 years really started hearing the outtakes and hearing him in the studio working with you guys. He he was a producer in his mind. He heard Absolutely. what he wanted and he, and he talked as a musician to you. Yes, and he knew exactly what he wanted. Number one, the studio was his safe place. Yeah. He was free to be himself, surrounded by people he respected and liked and doing what he loves to do. And so that was special because you know, back in that day, um, he could barely go out on the streets in most towns, you know. Yeah. He'd be mobbed. And so it was, I could tell that that's, he was so relaxed in the studio, you know. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and uh, you're right, he was kind of in charge, especially of the marathon sessions. Right. Yeah. He was, because this was music he wanted to do. And uh, it was great. Johnny Cash was another one like that. He was totally in charge of his sessions. Yeah. And, uh, so, and there were a few artists like that, uh, but uh, yeah, it was so cool to be there. Those Nashville Marathon sessions, the, the output distributed over so many albums, so many different kinds of music, and you guys discovering it. And those sessions, because you were a session guy and you had that, that ingrained scheduling about how things work, the Elvis sessions, everything was, you, you, would, you guys would put in full days doing sessions, and then the Elvis, that marathon week must have been, you must have not gotten any sleep marathon week. Yeah, I remember one morning I got out of the studio in time to go to breakfast and go to my 10 o'clock session. <laughs> of course, we were young, you know. Yeah. We could do it. But uh, yeah, it was, uh, he would, he liked to record at night. Yeah, well, and, and, uh, that was, that was the schedule that uh, he was, he had, we, we've always talked about it, that, that he had full run of, of Memphis because he was out at night. There was no one out to, to bother him and, and he was just having adventures and, and to be able to, to go into the studio in Nashville like that with you guys. I love that, the safe place. That was that was where he was doing what he was born to do and, and yep. you guys were a part of that. Yeah, it was, uh, and you know, Nashville musicians, uh, you know, like you throw them in a pen and something's gonna happen. And uh, the, the, the instincts and is is so great, and of course, working with him, you know, everyone was so happy to be there, and man, just magic happens. David Briggs is in the house. Come on, Come on out, David. Musicians Hall of Fame, Alabama Music Hall of Fame, friend of Norbert Putnam for many, many years. Elvis Session. Um, in the studio, you got the, you got a phone call. Oh yeah, but I was hired to replace Floyd Kramer until he got there. He had another session at Bradley's Bar. It was about 
25 miles away from RCA. And Floyd Kramer at the time. Floyd I mean, Kramer was the number one. Him and Pig Robbins were the number two, the number one and two session players almost in the whole world. Almost Floyd was so famous for his last day and things like that. And Floyd had played most of Elvis's records when he cut it nest. Mm -hmm. So I was just hired to take his place until he got there. And so Elvis came in a little bit early, and Floyd still wasn't there. And he said, where's Floyd? And they said, well, he, he'll be here. He's, he's at the bar. He didn't know at the bar. I said, he'll be here an hour late. So they introduced me to him. I was scared to death. Of course, Harry was the biggest star in the world. I was, you know, young, 20, whatever it was, 20, 21, or something like that. And he said, you know, we're supposed to do the gospel album. Said we'll do the high grade there. Our later he said, uh, do you know a song called Love Letters? I said, I've heard it by Kenny Lester. He said, yeah, that's the one. I said, well, he played all right on the chart. And Bob Moore and I wrote a chart together because it had a couple of changes and a little different. And we started to record it. Well, about the time Floyd came in, I said, oh, great. I got up and went back to the organ. And he said, well, hey, Floyd, Floyd, so now, Floyd said, what are we doing? I said, Love Letters. And he started playing Elvis. I said, I got used to it. That boy was going to Floyd, let him play. You go play the organ. Oh, no, God. It scared me. Like that. <laughs> so now was not only playing with the biggest artist in the world, yeah. probably. And probably the number one session musician, piano player in the world, behind me playing the organ. But he was a friend of mine. When I was a singer, I used him to pick and play keyboards. Yeah. So I knew him. So he just laughed at me. He didn't care. He played on dozens of Everybody. So no pressure. <laughs> oh, I was scared to death. And we had it a couple of times. You know. yeah. And you were able years later. That's why I talked to him to do it again because I thought I could play it better, but I didn't play it. But it was uh, it was different. I played it the way it should have been played. But the first record is the best because he was so good and in perfect tune in 1966. Yeah, yeah. And then the other one's good, you know. But uh, I didn't know they're better. Yeah, it, it was one of those songs that, uh, it, as Sam Phillips used to say, that was that was perfect imperfection. Yeah. Whatever you think was well, it, his, his vocal on that one, '66, was just perfectly in tune. You know, yeah. You know. Tell me about the the Elvis because you were one of those musicians that was able to see um, the two sides of the performer, and I love what Charlie said uh, that, that when Elvis was in the studio, that was his safe place. He was with yeah. the musicians he respected, and he was making music. But you saw that artist in the studio, and then you saw the artist in the studio. I just stage. knew, the only way I knew him then was in the studio. Yeah. And then I went out to Vegas just to visit. In fact, no, we were there, took our wives, and went out to just kind of sit around. And I got to see him one time, backstage a little bit, not much. And then the next, I went out the next year, and we were recording in L.A. I recently called me to L.A. to play with his road band. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, uh, adding to the, whatever, I could play club and I the piano. Mm -hmm. And so, at the end of the thing, he recorded three song, two songs that Norman I was Pieces of My Life and Honky Tonk Angel. Mm -hmm. Honky Tonk Angel was number one record. It just been number one by Conway Twitty. And he told our said, so this is my next thing. He said, oh, okay, it was number one. Twitty said, I don't care, but it was number one, but <laughs> a year later. Yeah. So he had already cut two of our songs, and he had a third one, he was going to cut it uh, here in Memphis in Stacks, we were right there. And so he came to me and he said, why don't you just go with me to Vegas? And I said, oh, I can't, I, had, I was booked, in those days I worked three and four sessions a day, sometimes seven days a week, if you work for Jimmy Bond, you work Seven days of Christmas, Thanksgiving, everything, but you made double double. Wow, it was, it was good money. And I said, now I look, I look solid. I have to cancel a lot of stuff, make a lot of people mad. You know, and it's that kind of business. If uh, you cancel somebody for your they won't use you. And so Felton came to me and said, man, I said, that guy has been so good to you, you crazy. You would go out there with him. And they said, yeah, just go out one night if you don't like it, you go home. I said, okay. So I went out and I stayed six weeks. <laughs> and then he started calling me when he had to. And I went out a couple of times in Vegas over the next year's coming up. That was 73 or 4. Then when he did that world's largest uh, show in Pontiac, Michigan, 
Jewish, the world's largest Jewish eating party. He yeah. called me and said, I'm scared, I'm nervous. It was the biggest show, 80,000 people. I'm thinking he's the number one guy in the world. He's scared. He said, I want you to come out and bring that hairnet cloud that whatever the hell it is. He said, I need to eat all the ones I can. So I went out and played that, and I did a couple of movie things where they just came and said, I played straight parts on the earth. And then eventually he said, well, why don't you just go to the Lord? So I went for a year. But that only meant 10 days a month usually, so I couldn't give up on my substance. Yeah. How did you all guys get jammed in that jungle room? I mean, that's not a... Yeah, it was crowded. <laughs> then, you know, I was telling you the other night, you know, when he was doing uh, Moody, 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 and he was standing right over my head, he looked at me, how you doing down there, Briggs? And I was playing electric piano, but it was muted, so it wouldn't leak into his vocal, because he liked to be really close to all the musicians. And RCA stood right in front of him, almost in front of me, and it was a good time. And you, you play it, 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 <laughs> for, for you and, and, and these sessions uh, and, and playing with Elvis, um, that Jungle Room session does stand out. The Nashville Marathon stands out. That, that those iconic sessions of the thousands, probably, of sessions that you've done, two of the most famous, the, the, the Nashville Marathon and the, and the Jungle Room. The Jungle Room was interesting because you were telling me the story about RCA brought the mobile recording unit here. Yeah, from Chicago. From Chicago. Yeah, and, and there were cables everywhere. Threw that them. out. But you also had another little console in the back of the den, but it was some kind of just a thing for us to mix headphones. And then the main feed went out to the truck to the guy with your name. The guy, I was going to say, there was, a, there was a recording engineer working out in the truck. His name was Tom Brown. His name was Tom Brown. And the first time I met Briggs, I, I knew Norbert, and they invited, Norbert invited me to go to lunch in Florence. And he says, I want to bring David Briggs. Oh, you got to meet Briggs, man. you got to meet Briggs. So they, and they told me later that when Norbert said we're having lunch with Tom Brown, Briggs goes, I thought it was in here. I said, he must be Donnie or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be there soon. I'll be there soon. But so when I met him, the first words David Briggs ever said to me, you're not who I was expecting. <laughs> Let me introduce to you now Norbert Putnam, interviewed by one of my favorite people. Please say hello to Mr. Tom Brown. And Norbert, I don't know if you realize this or not, but your base is going to be part of a display that has items from people like Dolly Parton and Justin Timberlake and John Stamos and The Rock and Kiss. And now this famous musical base of Norbert Putnam. And I remember talking to you when you were working on your book and, and you started counting up the songs that this bass played on. How, what, what's the number? What number did you arrive at? And for years, people would ask me, I said, you know, I played with him on and off for over seven years. And I thought I played on 40 or 50 songs. Well, Cheryl added them all up and it came to 120 songs. <laughs> wow. That's a lot of songs, you know? And so uh, I was shocked. And I'm still shocked. I thought he would have fired me long before that. <laughs> well, Elvis was kind of a, a fan of the bass. I mean, he was uh, known to be a bassist himself. That's right. He, he, he would either go to the piano on a break and play some old gospel tune, or he'd go over and thump around on my bass. <laughs> and, and do you remember the, the Bill Black thing he did early on in his career? Oh, where I... Yeah, it was around the pool in Jailhouse Rock. That one, baby, I don't care. You're so smart. Yeah, yeah. I don't care. Well, he loved to go over there and pick up my bass and play that part. It reminds me that if, that if I couldn't do it, he could probably pick it up and play it himself. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Black had trouble with syncopation. Yeah, and always went over. Do -do 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 -do. <laughs> and of course, Presley was, uh, <clears throat> and he was something to keep up with, I have to tell you. That one just never. He never worked up to the vocal over three or four takes, getting it more and more to it. He started out falling. The very first take, and we're all important. Hang on, guys. Hang on. <laughs> but he might get up at us. And, uh, and that kept us away. If he got it on the first take, and we've only played it twice, you know, one of us could go in and ask him, and he'd say, sure. One night I went in there, and he goes, oh, you want to see me do it again, don't you? <laughs> And he'd go out and do it better. Yeah. You know, the singing wasn't a problem for Elvis Presley. Yeah. And he, and he never worried about it. There's Angie.
I love how I didn't. He's, he gave me the case, and I brought it here, and I didn't. I, I was scared to open it up because I figured I was afraid he had a note in there going, "Tom, I knew you would open this up." We make items like this tell a story because this bass is not just an instrument, but this bass it's helped create the soundtrack of a lot of people's lives, and it was in so many iconic sessions. And to be able to have it on display and have people look at it and go, wow, I remember that song, or I remember hearing that song here, and this is the instrument that created that music, you know, it really kind of fulfills its destiny. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so in 2019, um, we actually started the Graceland Legends, which basically the idea behind Legends is to honor the musicians who helped create this music that really is the soundtrack to our lives. You know, Elvis had a great appreciation for the musicians he played with. He was inspired by them. And he handpicked the musicians himself. And so it's our honor this year to induct into the Graceland Legends Norbert Putman, David Briggs, and Charlie McCoy. And here to represent Norbert, not only his grace, one of his daughters, Eliza Avail. But to, to Elvis, that was one of the first people that, that he looked up to, that he came backstage. He was a fan. He, I always say that JD was Elvis to Elvis because he had a, 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 a relationship, a friendship, and a looking up to of, of JD's voice and talent and his presence. Tell us about JD. Well, um, Elvis was a big fan of JD's, and, they, and Elvis looked at, at JD as, as being a, a star, you know, because it was somebody that he looked up to. And one of the stories that, that uh, J.D. would tell, but J.D. always wondered why Elvis would never call him, call the stamps, you know, to come and, come and back him up. You know, he, had, he got the Imperials to, to work with him. And, uh, and finally, uh, they, they booked a tour and the Imperials weren't available for that tour. And so uh, Elvis did call J.D. And uh, the conversation was like, J.D., you know, and I'm, I kind of hesitate to ask you this because I don't, just don't know if you'd do it or not, but what if you'd come and uh, bring the guys and, and sing back up for me, you know? And G.D. said, well, good Lord, man. I've been, been wondering when you were gonna call me, you know? So, uh, so that's how that whole thing got started with, with G.D. He, he wanted to be, Elvis wanted to be surrounded in the studio by the musicians. He didn't want to go in and track things. He wanted everybody there mm -hmm. together. And on stage, he wanted yes. his, he wanted that gospel group. He had the, the Sweets, and he had the Imperials, and he had you guys. And he, he always wanted that gospel sound, even in the rock shows. Yeah. And uh, he always gave you guys a moment, too. He always hung yeah. on. Uh, there was always a gospel moment. Yeah, he would have us, uh, well, first of all, we, we would do the, the parts and how great they are with him. And, uh, but then he would have us come out and do the Sweet, Sweet Spirit, the uh, acapella song. And, um, you know, that was, that was kind of intimidating because we were in front of 20,000 people and at one point in Pontiac, Michigan, we were in front of 68,000 people. And he'll have us come out and sing a cappella, you know, just the four guys, five guys with JD. And I was always, you know, just concerned, you know, these people are not going to, you know, after Elvis has got the orchestra and this huge sound coming off stage and all of a sudden, it's just down to the five of us doing the acapella. You know, the people are going to start booing or start throwing something at us. You know, I had that thought in my mind. I just, but it never happened. Never, they loved it. Yeah. And I would always point to that. I said, you know, you don't have a gospel group come out and sing "Sweet Sweet Spirit" and not feel it and not be a believer. You know, you got to you got to have something inside of you to believe and to perform the way you do. So. You know, because his gospel record was, was the only record I had won a Grammy. Yeah. Uh, and then there was just so many songs out there that he, that he could have covered that would have just been killed. You know, and, uh, no doubt, he would have done more than I think. For you and, and being lucky enough to, to be a part of that, talented enough to be a part of that, uh, that opportunity, what's it been like the last several years? I know you've been on stage singing with, uh, with the big screen show and, and being a part of Elvis live events with Elvis's music, what do you think he'd make of all this 40, 44 years later now? That's a good question. 
I think, I mean, some, some part of him, you know, would be flattered and, and, and like it, and other parts, you know, he'd probably go, ah, you know, uh, just, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know that he would be impressed with, with uh, himself, certainly yeah, not with himself, yeah. you know, Cause, and, cause and he about him, because he was, he, he had a lot of humility. I mean, he really did, he was a sweet, humble guy. That um, he would be unbelieving. Of all yes, of yeah, that's a good term. Yeah. Some fun that Cynthia had with this gentleman right here. Take a look at this. Clip. Anyway, so I, I called my agent. He said, "Are you sitting down?" And I said, "Well, I will." You know, he said, "Well, someone Elvis saw you. Elvis Presley saw you on something, and he thought you might be right for this movie he's doing." And if you can get over to MGM right away, this is a Friday, uh, right away Friday, and, and go to wardrobe. And if you can fit into the wardrobe, you're co-starring with Elvis on Monday. Wow. Oh my God. And when I did my show Margie on ABC, I had to audition for two months. You know, I put in a girl in the 20s, the roaring 20s, and a high school girl. And so I was completely shocked. And I, of course, I grew up with Elvis. He's gorgeous. Oh, Elvis, I'd love to meet him. And I'll tell you a quick story. I was dating a boy who was uh, from Prague, but he went to school with him. And we lived in California, so we went to the movie to see Love Me Tender up in Santa Barbara. And I was going to marry this guy. He was my first love. So I'm, I'm watching Elvis, and I'm looking at my, my guy here. <laughs> and I'm thinking, hmm, now which one would I want to marry? I didn't marry either one, but I did meet Elvis, became friends, yeah. and uh, oh my God, he was just so down to earth. Short time to make Kiss and Cousins. Right. He was still wanting to have fun, and I, I see that scene that we, we looked at, and I know he loved messing with people. And oh, he messed, he messed with, with me. Yeah. He messed with me. He messed, uh, we were rehearsing the flip, mm -hmm. and he, of course he gave, you know, and helped me. And we were in the sound stage by ourselves, and he said, let's go with this, and I said, okay. and. Um, so I flipped him a couple of times, and I flipped him this one time, and he was flat uh, out, I thought, with his eyes closed. And I'm going, oh my God, I killed Elvis Presley. I'm going to have to go on the witness protection or something. I'm going to have to get out of here. And he let me do for about, I don't know, a minute, it seemed like 10 minutes, and he goes, I got you, speckled pup. And he called me that in the rehearsal, so they put it into the film. Oh. And I said, I'm going to get you somehow. I'm going to get you somehow. I did kind of get him uh, a little quick story, too. My dad uh, knew uh, a guy named Chill Wills, and he was doing the movie Giant. Yeah. Yes. And so, uh, and so he went over to this. I was 15. It was 1955. And I got a phone call, and I said, hello. He said, it was my daddy. And he said, someone wants to talk to you because it was my birthday. I said, okay, I'll never forget, verbatim. And I said, hello, and he said, hello, and I, he said, this is James Dean. Oh my God. Yeah, oh, uh, hello, and he said, your daddy said it was your birthday. How old are you? And I said, 15? He said, well, I just want to wish you a happy birthday, and here's your daddy. Gave the phone back to my dad, and uh, two weeks later, he was gone, but. Oh. And so I told, you know, I got to talk to James Dean, briefly. And Elvis loved James Dean. So I said, how can I get back at him that's not harmful, you know, harmful to him? So we were talking one of our many conversations, and I said, well, you know, I did something you didn't do. He goes, what, what? So I told him this story. He goes, oh, what was he like? Just like a big fan. I said, well, he was, you know, he was dying. He was short conversation. And I repeated it to him. He said, well, you got me there a little bit. You know, I didn't know how to get back at him. He didn't like practical jokes on him. Yeah. You know, that. He was always there for you, always. And that's the sign. A pro. That's the, 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 they always say that's the sign of, of, of someone that cares about the other actor, is that will show up when it's not, they're not on camera. Well, absolutely. Just so you're looking in there. At the real person. I mean, you still do it, but it's not the same. You know, yeah. uh, if we had a cardboard of you and you mouth. I want the real time. It would right? be about the same. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I don't think so. Well, thank you so much. He said, you know your mom? Worked with Elvis, didn't he? Didn't she? And he said, "Yes." He said, "Well, you have blue eyes, <laughs> and you have full lips, and it's not the right time." 
And yeah. <laughs> and, I said, and he's telling me this. And he, I said, yes. He said, well, I want to ask you two questions. And I said, what is that? I was afraid to ask him. <laughs> he said, well, uh, did you have a thing with Elvis? And am I his son? <laughs> and I said, well, the first thing, uh, it's none of your business. <laughs> the, the second one, no, you're not. And I'll get this. And he said, there's a pause. He says, oh, darn it. He said, it would have been wonderful. It would have been great. And besides, Dad wouldn't mind. <laughs> Well, my friends, I hope you enjoyed all those stories that we just got to hear. That was a great one. But we're going to call it a day. Thank you all for watching from Elvis Week here in Memphis, Tennessee. Goodbye.